Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm your host, Ana Trujillo-Limon, and today I'm super excited to be joined by a rising star in the profession, Akiva Alice. Akiva, thanks so much for joining us, and welcome to Framework. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Awesome. So I know you've been busy. Uh, I know you're a finalist for for uh, the Advisor Podcast Award from FICOM and Investment News. So uh, it's it's. I wanted to first dive into that before we we go into our regular questions, our regular fun questions. So talk to us about you know the awards and how you felt being a finalist. It's it's a really big deal and it's it's really cool. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, it was a really, really great experience. I mean, when I saw who else was nominated as top three in my category, I mean, 2050 Trailblazers, Rianca, like Next Gen in 10, Alana Phillips, like the show that I've been on, a show that I've been listening to for years. It was just really a full circle moment uh, for me. But it was really great also to just get the word out more about the podcast and also about the work that we're doing at Valentine and just my personal mission and how that feeds into everything that I'm doing. So it was really great to be able to share our stories, the stories of the people who we've had on the podcast to hopefully make for a better profession as advisors and just make us better people. Definitely. Well, congratulations on that. I'm being um, me named finalist. Um, what we're going to circle back to the podcast and I'll ask you a few more questions on that. So, as a podcaster, you know, I always want to pick your your brain and get your experience and, and your advice and stuff. So, one of the our favorite things to talk about here on Framework is food. We're big. I just had a delicious sandwich myself. <laughs> Sandwiches are one of my favorite foods, but we always like to ask, like, what what's your favorite food or your current food obsession? Yes, my favorite food is roti. So I am, my family is from Trinidad and Tobago. And so roti and curry, potato and chana, it's always been a big part of my life. And that is my, hands down, my favorite food has been since childhood. Yeah. So do you do you cook a lot? I don't, actually. Uh, it's one of those things that you love so much and never mm-hmm. actually took the time to learn how to make yourself. So uh. I purchased mine, <laughs> but I do need to learn. So that's a good prompt for me. Oh, gosh, it's always those delicious, your favorite meals. Like, for instance, we have um, in in my family a bizcochito, which is like a Christmas cookie that we make um, that's been passed down for generations. And I actually just learned how to make it last year. <laughs> so Better late than never. Exactly. So that's what I'm saying. There's still hope. You're pretty young. So you still have time yes. to learn how to make your favorite dish. Um, so one of another really fun question is what's your first money memory, your first memory around money? That is a good question. I feel like my first money memory really had to be around the 2008 recession. It was one of those things where I was kind of old enough to remember it, but still young enough to really not understand what was going on. I'm 25, Mm -hmm. by the way, so you could do some math. Um, And I just remember everybody like, freaking out. And I just didn't understand why you're hearing these big words like recession and then the markets Mm -hmm. are down and me as a child not understanding what in the world that meant. It just felt like everybody around me was stressed out about money and I didn't understand why. So I think those was one of my first money memories that definitely set the tempo for where my life ultimately ended up. So yeah, it made an impact for sure. It sounds like yes. So what was the first big purchase you made? Like a lot of like we always joke around. Jamie talks about his fog machine that he (laughs) bought when he was little that he still had until last year. I think it finally broke. But um, so talk to us about your first big purchase that you remember. My first big purchase probably had to be my car. I got my (laughs) first car senior year of college, and that was definitely by far like the biggest purchase I'd ever made (laughs) up until that point. (laughs) I was a pretty frugal person still am um, especially growing up and even in college I was real real frugal so getting my car was a really big moment for me made some mistakes and I've definitely talked about that before too and and happy to dive into that but it was my biggest purchase and still have it to this day I guess so I guess it wasn't too bad of a decision what kind of car is it it is a 2008 Toyota RAV4 Oh my gosh, that's I have so my first car, my first big purchase was right after college, and I bought a 2007 Toyota Yaris. <laughs> nice. And I had come from Miami, and I was like, oh, this is a cute little car in Miami. But then I moved to New Mexico where it snows, it has all four seasons there. And the Yaris, I should have got the rough one, yeah, <laughs> which is, yeah, that you made a good choice there. But but you said you made some mistakes, and talk to us about that, yeah. So I it still hurts me to this day every time I think about the interest rate that I paid on financing that car. So my interest rate was like 8%, which at the moment 
didn't seem as extreme. And then I realized a couple of years later how ridiculous that was and I promptly yeah. made a plan to pay it off early, which I did, thankfully. Um, but that was one of my major mistakes was just getting into an interest rate that was that high, right? Mm -hmm. There was so many things that I didn't do, right? I really did not comparison shop. I didn't try to get qualified for financing elsewhere. I just kind of went with whatever the dealer was doing. Mm -hmm. I really didn't compare vehicles too much i kind of just saw it and was like okay i know this is the one um so really in hindsight i would have done a lot more comparison shopping i would have definitely tried to get pre-qualified for financing elsewhere because mm, that eight percent was not cute <laughs> so those are some of the yeah. major mistakes that i made no i and i think like doing by i mean I guess age isn't really a, an excuse for us, but I was thinking that when I went to go buy my, it was my first dealership experience and I was kind of overwhelmed. Like, I don't even know what to ask for. Like, I also did the same thing. Like I had a high, pretty high interest rate on this Yaris, I ended up paying a lot more for it than, than right. the, you know, 15,000 sticker price or whatever. But um, I, I didn't even know, like, a lot, I think that's a lot of people don't know what to do, especially young people going into a dealership for the first time. Like, oh, I guess this is how it works, you know, but definitely when I finally did buy a RAV4, which I, I did recently, um, it was, you know, a totally different experience. Kind of you learn from those mistakes. So you, since you still have your RAV4, now you get to implement all that great w wisdom with your next car. <laughs> yes. Awesome. So talk to us about um, what did you want to be when you were little growing up and how did you come into financial services? Yeah, the only profession I really think that I seriously considered as a child was being a teacher. Mm -hmm. And it's really funny how I kind of ended up doing that anyway, in many respects. Yeah, sure. And so, yeah, I, that was like the only profession I really thought about as a child. And then as I got into high school and like started making the transition between high school and college, I then thought about business. And then I knew I wanted to do something in the business field, but I didn't know exactly what just yet. And then I learned about financial planning kind of midway through my freshman year. And I was basically sold on that mm -hmm. ever since. And, you know, the rest is history, as they say. So how did you learn about financial planning? What happened that freshman year? Yes. Yeah, that's the real question. So really, it really started during that transition period. So, you know, it's like senior year, I'm filling out the FAFSA, which if anybody's filled out the FAFSA before, you know what a behemoth of an application that is. Yes. Um, and I'm filling this stuff out and I'm looking at all these words and all these terms. And I'm like, I have no idea what this thing is saying right now. And like, why? Like, I can consider myself a pretty smart kid. And I'm just like, this This makes no sense. Like, why do I not know this? Like, I did not grow up in a house where we talked about money at all. I was just completely clueless when it came to all things money and finances. And I was just not okay with that. And then kind of, you know, thinking back to the times where I just felt like everybody around me just seemed like they were struggling with money for whatever unknown reason that we didn't talk about. I was like, this makes no sense and I need to do something about it. And so in Gen Z fashion, I just took to Google and went down this like rabbit hole of like learning, teaching myself about money concepts. And during that whole whirlwind, learned about the field of financial planning. I came across the CFP and NAPFA and I was just like a whole career where I can help people with their money. Like, where do I sign? I'm sold, like going all in right now. So that's really how I learned about the profession. There was no prior exposure or anything. It was really just me searching around on Google and happen to come across this field. That's cool. Yeah. So you you were definitely sold at a young age because you accomplished a ton within a short period of time. You know, you got your master's very young and your CFP is super, super young. So talk to us about kind of like, so you were sold and you you embarked on this path. What what made you get your master's degree and then pursue the CFP? Yeah. So the college I was at at the time, of course, by the time this is happening, I'm already in, in college. I've started down my bachelor's degree path. My college did not have a CFP board registered program. And mm -hmm. I found that out, you know, kind of midway through like, oh, there's a CFP board registered program. What is that? Um, so I basically majored in accounting and finance, you know, corporate finance. And so mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to sit for the CFP. And so I knew that I would need to do additional schooling to take the required classes to become a CFP. And I also knew that I wanted an advanced degree. Like I so said, that teacher mindset was still kind of in the back of my mind. And I knew that you needed a master's to teach in college. So I was like, okay, well, let me just go the master's route and get my master's degree in financial planning so that I'm able to have an advanced degree 
and also satisfy the requirements to sit for the CFP exam at the same time. So that's why I ended up doing my master's in financial planning. And the CFP was just like the natural next step, right? After doing that research and seeing the value of the credential of the designation, I had my sights set on that from pretty early. And I eventually did that. I'm now a CFP board ambassador, actually. So I get to now just talk about the CFP board and the CFP designation and how great it is and encourage other people to become CFPs too. Nice. So do that teaching, right? Teaching people about the CFP. There you are, the natural teacher in you. Mm -hmm. Um, So earlier you mentioned NAPFA and I are there organizations in the profession that you're loyal to or that have helped you? And, and what's your kind of advice to other next gen planners or younger planners who um, are considering communities like that? There are definitely a few organizations that have helped me along my journey. NAPFA played a very big role, specifically by way of mentorship. So in my mm-hmm. senior year of college, I went to college in Maryland, just outside of the D.C. area, and I was able to secure a mentor through NAPFA, a solo advisor who actually had a practice right down the street from my college campus. And so this was my first kind of foray into seeing the behind the scenes of what financial planning looked like. He would invite me over to his office. I could shadow him a few times and see kind of how he's working, the kinds of work he's doing for clients. So that was a really, really big thing that kind of really even more cemented my interest into joining the profession. So NAPA definitely played a huge role from that perspective. Quad A has played a big role as well. I have secured a mentor through Quad A as well. Of course, there's so many people you could look at as, as you know, for mentorship. But being that, you know, I, as if you're just listening to audio, I am a young Black woman and there are not many of us in this field mm-hmm. or as CFPs. And so finding those people who have walked a similar journey that you have um, is really helpful. And it was really helpful to me to be able to have those real conversations that maybe I Mm -hmm. could have as comfortably with other people. So that was really a big uh, affinity group for me as well. And I've been able to meet lots of other great Black financial planners through that connection as well. So those are two major groups, of course, CFP board and, you know, its affiliates, you know, just being in touch with the community, various CFPs has been great. Attending their conferences and sessions and meeting people has been really, really awesome. Uh, So I'd say those are really the main groups that I would say that I have interacted with over my time as a financial planner so far. So you brought up mentoring and that's a bit, I just wrote, wrapped up an article on mentoring. So it's fresh in my mind. So I'm curious about what your perspective is on what, what makes a good mentee? Like how, how do you contribute to the relationship? Like what's your advice to people to be of value to your mentor, not just the other way around? Yes. You really have to drive the relationship and conversation Mm -hmm. as a mentee. Your mentors, usually they are very busy people and they care about you, but you really have to take the bull by the horns, I found in a lot of situations, because that's how it's going to be the most valuable experience for you and for them. And Mm -hmm. so really being curious, honoring the time that you've scheduled with them, coming with questions and specific topics and, and ideas that you would like to discuss with them as much as possible really will help set the foundation for a great mentoring relationship and being curious about you know their background as well as much as they're willing to share because everybody's experience is different and Mm -hmm. you know even the two people who have very similar backgrounds on paper could have a lot of different value to add in various areas so don't be afraid also to have multiple mentors because they can each bring something different to the table for sure yeah I definitely agree with that um I like how you brought up uh you take the bull by the horns because I I I saw a post on LinkedIn that you made a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was like a month ago. And it, it just, I was so, I loved this post so much where you're like, this is what I want more speaking engagements. I want more articles. I want more, you know, um, appearances on podcasts. And I love that like sort of manifestation of the things that you want and it and making it happen. So talk to us a little bit about that and how, how can people, you know, do that for themselves? Yeah, just to give you some insight on that post, it was a really scary post to write. The reason Mm -hmm. why I actually wrote that post, it was actually as part of a challenge of a group program that I joined uh, to get more publicity. And they were like, hey, this is this is one of your first challenges. Put yourself out there. Write the post. Just ask for the opportunities. I'm starting to learn that, you know, closed mouths don't get fed. Right. So Mm -hmm. you got to put yourself out there and ask for what you want, because nobody is going to care more about your future, your career and your opportunities than you. And so it took me a while. I did procrastinate 
checking it quite a bit, but eventually I put it out there, as scary as it was, hit that button, press post, and it got a ton of engagement and, you know, lots of great feedback and opportunities that resulted from that. So I'm really glad that I did. And so I'm learning to be more comfortable with putting myself out there. I am not the type of person that is an extrovert. Um, I wrote another <laughs> follow-up post after that, even mentioning that, you know, social anxiety is something that I struggled with really bad for most of my life and, you know, panic attacks and things of that nature. So it, it does not come natural to me. However, I have learned over the years to be able to cope with it and, mm-hmm. and push through despite having those struggles. And so I would say definitely find the help that you need. If you're someone like me who really, you really struggle with this kind of stuff, get the help that you need. I've been in therapy. I have done the things uh, to try to help. And also, you know, it's a little, once you do it, it's a little less scary once it's done, if that makes any sense. So just try your best to put yourself out there because closed mouths don't get fed. Oh yeah. I love I, there's another one, another thing. Like, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. Yes. So, <laughs> I, I always think of that too when I when I'm doing things like that. But it, it, you brought up the social anxiety, and I'm I'm a big introvert, so like being on a podcast, that stuff is all like. And I know I'm sure you you feel the same at hosting your own podcast. Like, wow, it does, you really have to step outside yourself. And now that the world has opened up, we're all back in in person events, all back. What are your tips for like when you go to conferences or when you're at networking events for people like us who are kind of a little bit introverted, a little bit nervous, a little bit socially anxious. Yes. I actually just got back from a conference last week, believe it or not, my first in-person event since the pandemic. And it was a lot. I'm not going to lie. But some tips I would say, I'm definitely the person who prefers to go with someone that I know. So if there's someone Mm -hmm. from your team or a friend, even just your spouse that can tag along on the trip. So you have someone, you know, that familiarity that you can cling on to at the end of the day. I think that that really helps a lot. Um, Like if I'm able to bond with someone, do a little bit of scouting before the conference, see who's attending, maybe make some connections, say, hey, you know, I'll I'll see you at the conference. And you kind of have a built-in budget that you can kind of, you know, stick with kind of throughout the conference and and not being also afraid to share like, hey, you know, this is this is a little hard for me. Like, would you be willing to be this person? Because not everybody wants to have a tag along all the time, right? Different personalities. And so I'd say the more you can do that advanced research, I think the easier it would be um, because you're stepping into a place where you've already started to build some type of relationship with people. Mm hmm. That's great advice. And you brought up uh, bringing your spouse along uh, to take along at different events. So, so you and your husband actually do a lot of really great work together, a lot of good educational work. So talk to us about that. Yeah. So where do I even start? So our main <laughs> way that we work together uh, is through our platform, The Bemuse. And we started that as just like this little, little YouTube channel we decided to start just over four years ago. Essentially, why we started this is because... You know, I at that point, I had just started my career, right? I'm learning all these things about money. I'm in my master's program. I'm learning so much about money. And I'm working in a place where I am serving the ultra high net worth, right? And I just wanted to have an outlet to serve my community, right? People who are more like me. I didn't grow up with a silver spoon in my mouth, right? Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to be able to help other people who were more like me and young adults and just help get us on that path to, uh, you know, greater financial literacy and knowledge. And at the same time, you know, you might be thinking, so why YouTube? You know, someone is an introvert with social anxiety. Why being on camera, right? Why not just do a podcast or something that might seem a little lighter? It was also a challenge to myself to put myself out there and to try to combat that as well. And so I went to my then boyfriend and now has been with the idea and he was sold. He's also a big money nerd. And it was just, you know, we just started. We just started a recording video, sharing what we knew, putting it up online. And it's amazing to see the impact that it's had on people and how much even that work has grown into so many different avenues right now we have Mm -hmm. an online program group coaching program that we offer that is impacting lives and even just our content alone on youtube how much that free content has impacted so many tens of thousands of lives uh, online and so it's just really inspirational to see and i'm glad that i get to do it with my favorite person yeah that's so cool so um you, you you brought up the impact so talk to us a little bit about about the impact that you see or you know clients or people people who have been coaching members of yours how how what has the feedback been like and what what a sort of specific you know impact has that made 
Yeah, it's been great. I mean, just from YouTube alone, like even just focusing on the free content, we've gotten so many thoughtful comments where it's like, oh, well, thank you so much for this video. Like because of this little tidbit that I learned, I was able to implement this. One big thing, for example, that I shared in this random video and ended up being our most popular video that we've posted so far is the fact that you can save a quarter percent on your student loan interest when you set up auto pay with federal loans. I thought everybody knew that, but it just goes <laughs> to show like the things that you take for granted are things that a lot of people don't know. And everybody's like, I yeah. did not know this. Setting that up now. Thank you. Like just little things like that, that now thousands of people have been able to save money on because they saw that yeah. video. And then in our, you know, paid programs and stuff like that, our students are out here buying their first homes, you know, feeling confident to be able to navigate that process. One person was able to increase their credit score like 90 something points in like two months. It was like ridiculous. Um, just by learning so awesome. the basic things about credit that, you know, we were teaching them in the program, right? People who finally started budgeting, you know, after putting it off for so long and being so intimidated by it, things of that nature, even someone who's just like, you know what, I learned the one thing I've learned through this program is that I am frugal to a fault. I need to go take myself on a vacation because I can afford it and I can do that. And he's like, see you later. I'm like, there you go. Even if that is the outcome, like live your life. Money is here to be a tool have at it. So those are just some of the outcomes that we've seen so far from our programs and from our work on YouTube. And that's what it's all about, right? That's yeah. what the whole profession is supposed to be about. And I love that. That's awesome. Um, so so talk to us a little bit about some of the like hiccups or challenges when you first started putting out that video content, some things you kind of learned. Because I think a lot of video content is so impactful, but a lot of people are kind of scared of it, you know, like scared to have how they look or what, if they'll say something wrong. or what. So, so basically, talk to us about the challenges and, and give us some insight into that whole process, how that might work. Yeah, so video can definitely be intimidating for a lot of people. The way I looked at it, though, is just like, hey, it's not live. That's great. So if I mess something up, I can always take something out. I can always start over, right? It's it's definitely low pressure, lower pressure in that way than, say, being on live video, for example. Um, and, you know, at first, you will always hate the sound of your own voice. I'm just telling you from yes, now. It took so me true. so long to get over that, where I'm just like looking at myself like, eh. even now I look back at our like super old, we were watching a couple of our like first videos the other day. And it's just like, <laughs> oh, so cringe. We just know that your first videos are going to be your worst videos. That's something that I borrowed from uh, a popular YouTuber that gives a lot of YouTube tips. But it's very true. Your first videos are going to be your worst videos. Just just come to peace with it. Come to terms with it. <laughs> Nobody cares. It's going to be okay. All right. So it's just important to just start. And the more you start and just get into the rhythm, the easier it becomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I The sound of your own voice. So that is so true. Like I'll listen to the podcast. I'll listen to episodes. I'm like, I don't sound like that in my head. <laughs> I'm right. so much tougher and, you know, <laughs> more powerful in my head. But yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a, such a great point. So you kind of do a lot of things very well. And then one of those is the podcast. And we, we started off the episode by talking about your, your being a finalist for, for this podcast, advi Advisor Podcast Awards. So talk to us about the podcast, how you kind of got into it and, and that sort of thing. Yes. So the podcast in question, which is called the Ballantine Broadcast Conversations on Black Wealth, um, it was really the brainchild of myself and my manager. We were just having a conversation one day, as we do, you know, from time to time and talking about things, talking about the work that we're both doing, the work that the firm is doing, how we can further that. And something that we've been talking about with a lot of intention in is really about diversifying our client base, right? Like a lot of these DEI initiatives, as DEI has come to the forefront of conversation in the past two years, especially, a lot of firms have been focused on, okay, how do we get more diversity in our employee base, right? Hiring more financial planners of color or different aspects of diversity, right? And we're looking around like, okay, but what about the clients too? And, you know, especially as a firm that serves the ultra high net worth, it's like, okay, where are the wealthy black people and who's helping them? Like, mm -hmm. Who? And we had we just found that nobody was talking about this demographic. And, you know, we thought that, that was really we were uniquely positioned to be able to serve and to help and to be a voice in the industry from that lens and from that perspective, speaking to and speaking with ultra high net worth or high net worth 
black wealthy individuals and so that's where the idea for the podcast really came from because we felt like i said like nobody was talking about this nobody was asking them uh you know what their experiences were like or for their advice as we're trying to uh tackle this dei issue from multiple perspectives trying to close the racial wealth gap as part of our initiatives and uh you know as as a player in the industry so that's how that all came to be just through those conversations and that's such an important element that like I think both sides, just like you mentioned, both sides need to be built the client base, the employee base. And because there's a lot of research out there that finds that, you know, as a Latina, I might want to work with the Latina financial advisor. Like, like there's research out there that building the the diverse, you know, employee base will will therefore maybe increase the diverse uh you know, client base. And and I don't know, I don't know if that's necessarily true anecdotally or experientially in the profession, but definitely research has found that. So that's such a smart approach to tackle it on both sides of the equation, right? So it all balances out. Um, so, so what wisdom have you gleaned from the podcast in that, in, you know, serving ultra high net worth black families and young professionals? What, what kind of takeaways have you, you know, in all the interviews and the research and things like that? Yeah, so I'll save most of it for the podcast. Hey, go go listen to the podcast. It's it's anywhere Absolutely. you listen to the podcast, you can hear the takeaways <laughs> for yourself. So I won't spoil it too much for you, but I'll share <laughs> one or two. So one thing, one takeaway was kind of to your point just now about you know do do black wealthy people only want to work with black advisors? It's a common what we learned. A little bit of a misconception, right? That was one of the takeaways that we learned from from the podcast as well is that that's that's not always the case, right? That is not always the case. Interesting. And another thing we really learned was what people are looking for in terms of how they build no like and trust with an advisor. Um, mm-hmm. And so there were a lot of stories, a lot of anecdotes around how they prefer to to work with advisors, the way that they like things to be explained to them and the way that they like to work in partnership with advisors. Um, and so those are a lot of the, like the some of the takeaways that you'll hear when you listen to the podcast, as well as lots of other great juicy stuff. And hopefully we'll be able to kind of disseminate this information too in, in different platforms and modalities so that we can get this message spread across the industry. Absolutely. So w- S- similar question to the video stuff. What were, were some of the biggest hiccups in starting the podcast and biggest challenges that you overcame there? Yeah, I mean, at this point when I started the podcast, like I do everything for the podcast, by the way, from everything, literally everything for the podcast, finding the guests, recording, editing, publishing, publicizing all of the things for the podcast. So I would say the biggest hiccup because I was so used to editing and stuff from my YouTube experience and and media, um, that wasn't necessarily the hard part. I think the hard part was really finding the guests, right? Because you have to put yourself out there. You have to get introductions to people and get the right people to come on to the show. And so I think that was the, the most challenging part. Um, but thankfully, like I said, just being in community with these different affinity groups, I was really able to find some really great, awesome, amazing guests for the podcast. I'm looking forward to finding more amazing guests as we go forward and kind of, uh, you know, as we're working on our next season of the podcast right now. What are some of your like guest finding? Like, I know I like to read a lot of articles, read a lot of industry publications, and sometimes I'll reach out to folks that way or when I meet people at conferences. So those are kind of two of my main methods for finding podcast guests. Um, talk to us a little bit about some of your methods that, that you, I mean, you don't give away the secret sauce if you don't want to, but some of the, your favorite places to find guests. Yes. So specifically because my guest profile is very, very specific. I think the Mm -hmm. places I needed to also look were very, very specific. I really started Mm -hmm. with the lowest hanging fruit, people who I knew could connect me directly to people or people who I had a direct connection with. Right. Because, you know, newbie podcaster with no, you know, proven experience or presence, right? Coming to big name XYZ, asking him to be on my little podcast, right? I I just didn't want to kind of go that route. I want to kind of go for, you know, the people who I knew would probably be able to commit, um, at least initially, Mm -hmm. uh, as we were just starting up. And so I went to one of the Facebook groups that I am in, an affinity Facebook group where I knew that I'd find some of my people and they definitely came through. So that was the way I found most of season one's guests very cool yeah so I'm always curious about fellow podcasters and the type of you know do you do you hire a producer do you you know freelance somebody to do that did you teach yourself how to do all the you know behind the scenes production work talk to us a little bit about that journey and how that works for you 
Yeah, so I do everything for the podcast myself. So finding the guests, doing all the back and forth, the logistics, the recording, the editing, the publishing, the publicizing, I do it all. So it really came naturally to me being on YouTube for so long. Like the I edit my podcasts in the same software that I do to edit my YouTube videos, for example. And I also use Riverside. (laughs) And I had learned about it just before starting the podcast. And it's never given me an issue yet. It's kind of new for most people where they're like, oh, it's not Zoom. And it's like, no, we're using Riverside. (laughs) Um, But outside of that, once they actually get on, it's usually pretty smooth sailing. So uh, yeah, a lot of it was really self-taught just from my YouTube experience. That's really cool. Yeah, we have a, a good team here. We have Broderick uh, on mute right now in the background. He he also has his own podcast outside of this and, and does a lot of really great work. So it's nice to have those expertise. But that's, you know, definitely commend when you you, you do it all yourself because it's a lot of work for sure, for sure. Um, so talk to us a little bit about, you know, coming into the profession and working for a few for 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 several years already in it. Um, what are some of the changes that you you wish like if if the profession could change like one big thing for you what would that be yeah that's a loaded question and honestly (laughs) my answer really will have to tie back to the DEI space like I know we've been trying I know we've been doing a lot but I'd like to see some more okay so that's really my biggest thing and where I focus a lot of my energy and time and attention now is to diversifying not only just Valentine right where I'm working but also the industry at large uh, partnerships we've developed with CFP board for example sponsoring their diversity summit uh, establishing a scholarship specifically for aspiring black and Latinx financial planners and CFPs uh, so that we can help be part of the change as well and so I think that mission is really near and dear to my heart especially as you know someone who entered this industry really kind of sight unseen and and kind of by happenstance, not because someone intentionally told me that this was an option for me. And so increasing opportunities for exposure as well. um, I think all of that stuff is really important and that I'm really passionate about. Oh, yeah, that's the DEI initiatives, too, are also very near and dear to my heart. Um, And I think, like like you said, making strides, but still have a long way to go. And -hmm. some of my biggest things, too, are like that that barrier to entry that I love when people are offering scholarships or or taking down that barrier for diverse populations, you know, like the BLX internship, they do really mm-hmm. great work because it is very cost prohibitive to, you yeah. know, sit for your CFP, to study for it, to take the coursework necessary. It's a very cost prohibitive thing. And a lot of people, I mean, that that's one of the barriers. Yeah. But um, another thing I'm curious on your opinion about is like, the role of benefits and compensation and transparency in that whole arena, like what role do you think that plays in our efforts in this area? A huge role. I will say personally, I knew going into the industry, I was only looking at fee-only firms, just being straight up blunt and honest, because I knew that I couldn't be on nobody's commission nowhere. So I was looking specifically at fee only financial planning firms because I would needed to have a livable wage, consistent salary. Um, and that's how, you know, we are compensated at Valentine specifically. It's a base salary and bonus like any other job. And so I liked that. And I think that also greatly reduces the barrier to entry, especially for people who are now coming in and may not have the connections, the client base to pull in new clients or to make commissions that way. And so that was really important for me and a trend that I'm seeing uh, really pick up, especially with new entrants into the profession, especially those of color are looking for that more and more. No, for sure. That stability is really key in our, in our, I, I think in our communities too, like, you know, kind of growing up, our parents always preach like, get something stable, get something that, you know, you could have a stable income and, and support yourself, support your family. So that's like a really, that's a really big thing personally that I always look for in any job is that stability. And, and a lot of people are like that. So that's such a good point. Um, One of the things, too, I was, you know, talking to a a lot of young professionals, specifically young Latinas in the profession and getting some feedback on the some base salaries for people who have very impressive credentials, your master's degrees. And they were a little low for my (laughs) for my days. So that's another big thing I feel like the profession needs to kind of work on is that transparency and pay and kind of paying the young diverse female specifically more because I I think that a lot of firms are getting, you know, 
not not doing that. And I think that's also a barrier to entry, right? If you can't, you know, the profession promises this, like you're going to do well and, and for people and do well for yourself. And then you're not able to do well for yourself. That's kind of a yes. big deal. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. So sal- salary transparency is like a really, really big passion area of mine. Like I could talk about that. Okay, yeah. It was also something I was out. very vocal <laughs> about at Valentine too. So now we do have salary transparency. Every post that goes out has the salary range in there, um, which is, I think also helps just eliminate a lot of unnecessary work on both people's ends and like wasted time. Right. So mm-hmm. you don't have people applying for jobs that, you know, don't meet the expectation and it just saves you a lot of time and and energy on on both sides. It just makes so much sense. And so I think having that transparency and sticking to what you have published, Mm -hmm. I I will stop there is really, really important. So yeah, salary transparency is definitely something that I'm very, very passionate about. And I always advocate for um, wherever I'm at in whatever circle that I'm in. Yeah. So um, also curious about your advice to, you know, I, the like young professionals coming in, what is, what are some of your tips to kind of, you know, overcome any, any sort of barriers to entry or to like succeed when you actually get in and, and, you know, pass those barriers and you're in, what are some of your tips for both of those sides of the equation? Yeah. So I will say at all levels, always be curious. Financial planning is one of those industries that requires continuous learning. Right. And so having a curious mindset, reading, doing whatever you need to do to keep yourself up to date on what is going on. The latest changes in the industry will always put you a step ahead and really be a resource for other people who you might work with that they can look to you as kind of uh, someone who who's in the know, right? You make yourself a very valuable person that way. So being curious definitely is one big piece of advice that I have. Um, another big piece of advice is to kind of going back to what we were talking about before, right? Ask for what you want, okay? Because nobody's going to give it to you and nobody's going to care more about your own career trajectory than you will. So find those opportunities to move your career in the direction that you need and want it to go. That's what I would say. Take control of your own career development. For example, at our firm, we do annual performance reviews, as most companies do, right? Right. For me, that wasn't enough. So I specifically ask any manager I have, hey, can we do this quarterly? And there's never a pushback. But it's just so that that cadence works best for me. I know where I am at any given point in the year. And there's no surprises when your annual review comes around. And so things of that nature, just as a small example, that you can ask, make the ask. If that is what you need to to thrive, don't be afraid to voice that. Yeah, that's a really great, that's really great advice too. Because, and that ties into kind of what we were talking about earlier, that advocating for yourself, it gives you more opportunity to get in front of your managers and advocate for yourself and show like the good work you're doing throughout the year, not just once a year. Mm -hmm. So I I love that. I love that advice. Um, So, you know, kind of we're we're getting near our time and wanted to kind of ask something of you that, you know, so... Is there, is there something you want to communicate to our listeners that maybe I wouldn't know to ask you or that you you would want it, you wanted to talk about? That is a great question and one I'm not exactly sure how to answer. We covered a lot of ground in this episode. Okay. We have really touched <laughs> on a lot of different things. Um, I would just say if there's anybody listening who's considering entering the industry and maybe you have hesitations, do it. I open myself up as a resource to people. If you have questions, if you have concerns, if you have thoughts, if there are barriers to entry that you want to work through, I'm happy to have that conversation with anyone. It's a really, really great profession, a really great field, a really fulfilling field where you see the tangible impact of your work each and every day in the people that you help. And I, you know, am really excited to see and have more and more people join. Absolutely. Definitely life changing work in our profession. For sure. And uh, just two more questions. One is I, I was recently at a, a startup grind networking event and th- they asked this question. I thought it was so fun. So I'm like, I'm going to use that. Um, but it was what is your useless superpower? Like something you're really good at that really has no, you know, no, no useful place in the world. But it's just like something fun that you're good at. <laughs> I have never been asked that question before. And I'm really struggling right now <laughs> to figure out an answer. Um, <laughs> So I recently, 
Yeah, I so I recently posed it on Twitter last night, and a lot of people were like, "Oh, I can tell what direction it is at any any given point. I can tell whether I'm facing northeast, south or west." South or west. Um, somebody but that's else helpful, said, though. I, "Like that's still useful that's in the I world. Like, that doesn't count." <laughs> That's what I said. I'm like, that seems really useful. And she responded like, well, not in the like time of cell phones when you could just get directions. I'm like, oh, I guess. But if you're lost in the woods, definitely very useful skill. Um, let's see what some of the other fun ones were. I can recall movie quotes or like how old I can tell how old actors are. Like just guessing. Yeah. So something silly like that. Maybe I just thought of one. Maybe you tell me if this counts. I have a gift that I can really sleep anywhere, any place. Like I'm that person oh, where, like, the second I sit down on a flight, like I'm gone. Don't I don't know when I've taken off, landed. Like it's a gift. I can sleep anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's uh, that's a skill. It's a skill because a lot of people say they that. can't do that. It's a skill that really is useless, but it's real helpful to me. So. Well, it's useful to you because you get super. You're rested when you get places. Like I can sleep on. I I can do that, and I wish I could because. We recently took a long trip and it was just like, I can't, I need to fall asleep and I can't. And I was getting so frustrated with myself. So I wish I had that, that talent. Uh, so the last thing we, we like to talk about is ending on a positive note. Um, what's the legacy you want to leave both in the profession and in, in the world? Yeah, I think the legacy that I want to leave on the profession is doing things in service to close the racial wealth gap. And there's so many different things that, I am a part of now that I would love to do in the future that are all in service of that mission. So whether it is by diversifying the financial planning industry, whether it is helping other people, uh, black people, other people of color with their finances so they can level up, whether it is, you know, working with the black wealthies who help them keep and sustain their finances through the generations, all of these different things that I'm doing are all really in service of the same goal, which is closing the racial wealth gap. And so the more that I can do to fuel that goal, I think that is definitely the legacy that I would like to leave on the profession and on the world. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for making time for us today. I know you're doing a lot of really great work, so we appreciate you taking time for us today at Framework. Of course. I appreciate having you on. Yeah. And before we head out, um, tell people, you said people can always connect with you. What What's the best place to do that? Is that on LinkedIn, Twitter? T- 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 tell our listeners. Yeah, LinkedIn, definitely. Um, my name is very SEO friendly. So I swear if you just type in my first name on Google, I promise you'll find me somewhere. Um, but yeah, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. If you want to check out the YouTube channel, it's at The Bemused. Uh, on Instagram, at The Bemused. We're also really active on Instagram there. So you'll either hear from me or my husband replying to you on Instagram if you check us out there. But yeah, those are the the main places. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. 